Good morning, everyone. So we are starting with this keynote. Uh, I think that the title of the keynote changed, Francesc? Maybe, maybe it's, it's possible, it's possible. But we have a, a, a presenter that I, I really appreciate because I've been in working in supercomputing for some time and he had one idea that now it is quite common, which is the starving processors. Processors are looking for food to be fed. And now everyone uh, today agrees with him, but he had that idea some time ago. I mean, it's not my idea. I mean, I, I am co convinced that vendors already realized that like 20 years ago, right? But, that's a software but the thing developer. is that in general, people is not aware of this, of this uh, issue. And I started talking about, about this um, maybe six, uh, six years ago or seven years ago. For yeah. software developing, six years is like the age of the universe. <laughs> so please welcome Francesca Altet that will talk about how new computer trends thank affect you. us. So thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks for the organization for inviting me, for giving this keynote. Uh, it's nice to, to see um, so many people attending this kind of conferences. I remember in 2002, in uh, the first EuroPython conference in Charleroi in Belgium, I think we were like uh, 100, more or less, all uh, from the, all the parts of Europe. And nowadays, 14 ye years later, we have more people registered in this conference than than 14 years ago, so it's, it's nice. This, this, this says a word about the, how vibrant is, uh, is the Python community. So I am a freelance consultant. I am ready to, to tackle, to help people in projects. And I will start by uh, citing a quote by Isaac Asimov. When I was a teenager, I read a lot of books by uh, Isaac Asimov, especially uh, sci-fi books, not only sci-fi, but, but uh, I especially like it, uh, sci-fi books. And uh, he was really a very good writer, very intelligent man. And he was asked um, many times why he was so interested in sci-fi. In, in, in <coughs> And one of his answers was really interesting for me. So he said that uh, realizing the future, or in particular, he said that no sensible decision can be made any longer without taking into account not only the world as it is, but the world as it will be. So sci-fi for him was very interesting for projecting the tendencies and then taking measures uh, in, in advance for the, for, to, to, to these tendencies. So during my talk, I would like to convince you that no sensible, in the same way, no sensible decision can be made any longer without taking into account not only the computer as it is, but the computer as it will be. It's very important. So let's, let me say a few words about me. Uh, I am a physicist by training, computer scientist by passion, and also a, an open source enthusiast, okay? I am, my first serious project was PyTables, which is uh, now, it's uh, quite used because it's one of the backends of Pandas for serializing data. It's quite powerful. I will say a, a few words about it. But right now, my main projects are BLOSC, which is a high-performance compressor, and then also Bcalls, which is a, a data container that can that leverage BLOSC as well. Why I am doing open source projects? Well, I think a programmer, uh, every programmer, and that means every one of you has an artist inside. Okay? Programming is a lot about art. It's not only about technique. And uh, you know, when you, have, when you are doing art, you are full of ideas. And, but it happens that sometimes realizing these ideas is not easy, right? But it's absolutely necessary. And in fact, as Manuel Oltra said, the art is in the execution of the idea, not in the idea itself, 
because not much left is, uh, uh, <clears throat> there is not much left just from an idea. And of course, real artist also needs to ship, needs to offer these ideas, the realization of these ideas to the public, to the public in general. So for me, open source is a nice way to realize yourself while you are helping others. You are giving part of your time to the community, okay? And giving your time, giving your love, it's important. Uh, PyTables was my project like for nine years. It's a long time. PyTables is a, it's a wrapper, Python wrapper for SDF5. But it's not just a wrapper, but implements different capabilities that are not inside HDF5 itself. So for example, it implements like uh, queries, indexed queries. And, uh, and I started experimenting with indexing uh, in the past decade. And also I got interested in, um, in implementing out of core expressions. That means that when you have arrays in memory, um, and it doesn't fit in memory, you need to, to store this array on disk, and you should be able to, to, do, uh, execute, to, to do operations on these arrays. So I implemented that in, in PyTables as well, and this is, it is quite, quite useful. But most, most importantly, I also started experimenting with, um, with compression, okay? So I really got very interested in compression while I was working with, with PyTables. So let's go to the real meat of the, of, the, of the talk. I am going to talk about recent trends in computer architecture. Also, why we need a speed. Everyone needs a speed, but especially in storing and processing as much data as possible using your existing resources. And at the end, I will talk a little bit about uh, BLOSC and because as, just as examples of compressor and data containers that leverages uh, the principles of newer computer architectures. Okay, let's go with some trends in computer storage. In the past decade, or maybe more than one decade, we have seen that the, the, the gap between the, the RAM speed and the hard disk is, is large, and it's, it's increasing bit a bit, okay? In this, in this period, the vendors have introduced new technologies that fit between the hard disks and memory, okay? This technology is called SSDs, okay? Solid state disks. Solid state disks now are very common. Almost every one of you will have one of these in your laptops. They started like a, just a, a replacement of the, of the hard disks using the same buses, okay, than the hard disks. But recently, vendors realized that these buses became a bottleneck as well, and they are implemented, implementing SSDs on top of PCI Express, right, which removes this bus limitation, bus bandwidth limitation. And recent trends are that they are making these devices smaller and smaller, okay? This is really meant for laptops, for example. And this is the newest incarnation of SSDs that um, this, this is the size of an SD card. So this is really, really small. And that means that you will be able to have SSDs just in, in your iPhones or in your smartphones, in, okay? And the interesting thing is that these SSDs, uh, very small SSDs, uh, will also have PCI Express um, bus. So that means with these very small devices, you will have extremely fast data storage. In my opinion, the new applications should be able to leverage all this technology, especially uh, SSDs with PCI. Also, when you are designing new software, new applications, you must be aware of latencies, okay? Latencies is the time that it takes be uh, between the, uh, the processor ask for some data and the time that the data starts to flow to the processor, okay? And that uh, is, um, 
a very important issue as Jeff, uh, Jeff Dean and Peter Norvig from Google uh, realized uh, several years ago. So in their opinion, every programmer that is meant to, to deal with, with I.O. should be aware of the different latencies, okay? The interesting thing for me about this is that uh, when the CPU asks for some data, we are calling this uh, the T-ref. The, 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 the T-ref is the time, the T-reference, for, for a reference, is the time that passes between the, the request for some data until the request, uh, the, the device, the disk, for example, starts to transfer, to actually transfer the data, okay? Because there is a, a latency time for getting, for the storage to getting ready in order to, to, to start transmitting that. And of course, we have, we, we need to optimize that by making these, these times at least very close, okay? Because if the transmission time is much more, is much more slower than the reference time, the latency time, we're wasting time. Most of the time is, is, is spent, okay, by the, by the storage preparing data to, to, to be sent. And that's, that has uh, implications on how we should access the media, the storage media, okay? So, for example, for memory, the latency times, the typical latency times, are 100 nanoseconds. This is the typical one. And for the typical speeds, it's, uh, that means that um, we, we are able to transmit up to one kilobyte in this time. Okay? For solid state disks, uh, this uh, optimal block is four kilobytes. Okay? And for hard disks, it's around one megabyte. So that means that as the slower the media, the larger the block it is worth to transmit, okay? But the most important thing is that when we want to get better, uh, best performance, that means that we should access our data in a blocked way, okay? This is extremely important, independently of the media that you are using, if it is memory, disk, or whatever, or network. Okay. So, we need, we absolutely need more data blocking in, the infra, in, in our infrastructure, in my opinion. And unfortunately, not many data containers focus on blocking access, okay? Of course, we are not going to get a civil, bu uh, a civil bullet. Mm -hmm. And we won't be able to find a single container that makes everyone happy, okay? Every data container, if it's NumPy, it is, num, it is Pandas, it is Bicols, whatever, they will have, all will have their drawbacks and they will excel in something. It's all about trade-offs. And, uh, but the important thing is that uh, with block access, we can use either persistent media, like disks, or as it is ephemeral, and the other way around. So we, if we use blocked access, we get some kind of independence of the media. And that, that's also a very important thing that we should be uh, aware of. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's put this question, okay? We know th that uh, we can get um, better performance by using SSDs, but we can put this question. Can we get better bandwidth than the hardware allows? It seems like a contradiction in, in itself. So, let's see. So, for example, these are um, a fact sheet of um, a performance sheet of, uh, of um, the solid state disk, Intel solid state uh, drive, 520 series. Okay? And these devices, and lately most of the solid state disks use compression internally, although you are not aware of that. Okay, and when you use, uh, when you disable the, the, the compressor in, in the driver of the of the of the hard disk, you see this uh, this this performance. Okay, so for example, so for sequential write, you get 235, but by using compressible data, you can get up to 520. Okay, so that's a nice improvement that compression allows us to, to do, but 
not this is not not doesn't always work because for read uh, for reading we had we have no improvement okay and uh, when we when we are doing random write and random read we have similar behavior okay for writing we we are accelerating a lot not for reading anyone i am going to put your question the first quiz quiz anyone knows why there is this magic number here that we cannot pass, like uh, 100, uh, 550 megabytes per second. Why there is no improvement in this, in this area? Anyone has a hint? This is a magic number, yeah? Exactly. This is a solid state di disk that is attached to the SATA2 bus. SATA2 bus has a memory band with limitation of 500 megabytes per second, which is exactly what we are seeing here. So although we could be able to get more performance, we are limited by the bus in this case. How, it's, how we can get rid of this limitation? In my opinion, a much better strategy is not to trust in compression in the same device, but use compression at the CPU level. So let's see. If we can store the data in a compressed state on disk, okay, we need to transmit less information than we, if we need to transfer all the data in a, in a compressed state. Okay? Of course, we have an overhead because we need to decompress this data in order to, this, to the CPU to be able to operate with it. The, the thing is, if you sum these two times, the transmission time and the decompression time, and these times are less than the time that it takes to transmit all the compressed data into the CPU, we're actually getting more performance, right? We can, we can fit the CPU with more data per second than using a compression. The only thing that we need is that this overhead here is not too much. This is the only thing. So what's the state of the technology for that? The CPUs will, will be able to decompress that uh, fast enough. These are, this is a, a plot that I got like uh, six years ago when I was experimenting with blocks and pie tables. This is the, the performance, the perceived performance of, um, of the throughput. And uh, we, we see that by using different kinds of compressors, in green we have uh, Zlib, and uh, Zlib is the, is the compressor behind Jzip, which is quite, quite common. And uh, in red, this is LCTO, which was one of the fastest compressors at the time when I was, uh, before I started working on BLOSK. And uh, we see that um, these two compressors were already able to get better performance out of, uh, of hard disk. This, this was a hard disk using a, a SATA, a regular SATA. I think the, the, the bandwidth was 150 or 200, something like that. And uh, we, we have seen, I, I saw that uh, I was able to get better performance, but I wanted to push the performance um, uh, at maximum, and by using BLOSK, I was able to uh, get much better performance than that. So by using BLOSK, and if the data is compressible enough, of course, okay, I was kind of doing tricks because this is really, really compressible data. But my main idea was, was saying, hey, the compressors can, get, can, be, can be used to get much, much better performance out of, of this. So now let's uh, put another question, how to get maximum compression performance, because we, we know that getting maximum performance, uh, compression performance is going to allow us not to store more data using the same resources, but also in, in, many, in many cases to accelerate our computations, especially if they are out of core. And for that, we need to understand the recent trends on the evolution of CPUs, okay? 
I've seen this plot first time, like 10 years ago, maybe. And um, this plot is really, really interesting because it shows the evolution of the CPU speed in green, Oops. and in red, the evolution of the memory speed. And we can see that through the time, we, 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 see, we are seeing a gap which is wide and opening. And there is no signs that it's go this is going to stop. Okay? So that means that 20 years ago or 30 years ago, when the CPU asked for some datum in memory, he was able to get the response in, this, in the next clock cycle of the CPU. There, this is not the case any, anymore. Right now, the CPUs have to wait more than 100 cycles before they actually get the response. And this is, this is extremely important to be aware of, okay? So we need to fight about, I, call, I, I like to call this the CPU starvation problem, because most of the time, our, our modern CPUs are starving for data. They need data in order to process them. The problem is so apparent, vendors realized that really early, right? And in the past decade, or two decades, they were adding level, uh, cache levels in the CPUs just to palliate this, this, uh, <coughs> this gap, okay? And nowadays, in this decade, having this hierarchy, memory hierarchy, is quite common, okay? Having mechanical disks, solid state disks, main memory, and up to three levels of cache. Okay? An educated guess is that in the future, this hierarchy is going to be much more complex. Okay? And in my, this is a little bit a projection on myself, but I think it's, it's a quite educated guess. And we will, we will see uh, nine levels of, um, of memory okay? in the hierarchy. This X point thing is the initiative that is led by Intel and Micron for um, having memory which behaves very close to RAM, but it, that is persistent, okay? And it fits right between the SSD PCI and RAM in terms of speed and, and latency. And you know, programming this, this sort of things is not exactly common, but if we use the blocking technique, as I explained before, we have changes, uh, chances, and defining the, the, the block size, uh, depending on the, on the memory level that you are, it's important, will be more and more important to get better performance. More for coming threats, trends. So the CPUs are getting more and more uh, cores inside of the same die. Recently, Intel announced a Xeon with, with uh, I think it's 24 cores, which is really a, a big number, okay? And sometimes getting uh, all, the, all of them working for you, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a challenge. Then another trend is that uh, CP, modern CPUs has a special, special, hardware, uh, um, special hardware, special machinery for, for doing vector operations, and they are increasing the size of the bus of this, uh, of this uh, simple instruction multiple data hardware. And leveraging this is really, really important. Not many applications do that. But the hardware is, is there for ages. I mean, ages in computer science, as Guillem said, is like uh, 20 years or, or less than that. And finally, we are seeing a CPU plus a GPU integration. Both AMD and, and Intel are integrating GPUs inside the same, the same CPUs. And not many software is taking lever is leveraging this, this integration as well, okay? So the compressor, the pulse compressor, is using these new advances in, 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 in CPUs that not many others are using, right? In particular, 
it uses uh, it is multi-threaded, so it uses many cores, um, multi cores efficiently. It also uses SIND in order to do transformations before the compression stage, right? In order to allow the compressor to go faster. Okay. And the only thing that it doesn't use currently is the is the GPU. Okay. But probably the next version of BLOSK should be able to use the GPU as well. And that allows, I think, that uh, many people is quite except, uh, skeptic about, about it, right? With that, Blosk is able to easily beat, many times, the speed of a, a memory, memory to memory copy, okay? The MemCPY um, system call. Just by using more threads and by using SI and the acceleration. For me, there is nothing wrong on that. Memory is like a storage media, okay? And we are using um, tricks to compress that and transmit this information into the caches. So we are transmitting less information to the caches, okay? So this is perfectly possible, but also with, with uh, high implications. So we are seeing that we can, we can improve RAM speed. So in the same way that we were improving the speed of reading disk, memory is another memory layer, right? So the only thing is that we need to make the compressor fast enough. And we, can, we, we have seen that BLOSK is able to accelerate memory performance. Not in all cases, but in many cases. And my projection is that this will be happening more and more in the future. Okay? And in fact, the vendors are realizing that. Intel has just implemented compression in hardware to get, uh, to compress textures and to bring textures in a compressed state from RAM into the, into the CPU, into the GPU that is integrated in the, in the CPU. Okay? My opinion is that hardware compression is nice because it's fast, but it's not as flexible as software compression. Here we have an example for those that uh, came to my, to my workshop on, um, on Friday uh, about a real data, uh, real data set. Uh, we see that um, Bcalls, which is one, compre one data container that uses BLOS behind the scenes, uh, it can get better performance by using the data, the data container in a compressed state that if we, were, we are not using in a compressed state, okay? This is a clear demonstration of that. And this is the time that takes Pandas that uh, is doing the query on, on disk, uh, on memory, sorry. And the nice thing about Bcalls, as we will see, is that it, will, it allows the data contents to be not only memory, but also on disk. And the API is exactly the same. So for Bcalls, memory is exactly the same, the same media than disk, but uh, with different properties, with different latencies and different block sizes. This has not been always the case. For example, using a, an older laptop, we see that we have still the overhead in, in compression, okay? So in newer, in newer CPUs, we, we are already seeing the, the speed up. And of course, the other important thing of compressed containers is that they allow us to spend less resources for tackling the same data. Or, setting in other words, with the same resources, you can handle much more data. So BLOSK is meant not to accelerate things from the mechanical disk to the CPU, but it's especially meant for uh, tackling, accelerating the the, um, the performance between the solid state disk and also main memory to, to the CPU. Uh, you have not to take my word of it. I mean, independent people has tested many different compressors and they are very pleased about BLOS performance, okay? And that means also that people in general is becoming more and more interested in compression for a reason. 
Now, in the last part of my talk, I'm going to explain the, the principles of B-calls, but why B-calls allows so much speed. It's not only about using compression. You need more uh, for, getting, for getting that. This is what I promised for the people who attended to my workshop, that I, I was going to explain the, the principles on why B-calls is so fast. So what's Bicalls? Bicalls provides data containers that can be used in a similar way than NumPy or Pandas. They can be indexed the same way. They can be sliced. They can be, you can die and, and slice as, as much as you want. The main difference is that data storage is, is chunked. It's not contiguous. And it's chunked just because it is blocked. And as I said before, blocking is the essence of doing that, of doing operations if we want to do uh, improved uh, I.O. It comes with two flavors, CRA, which is meant to store, to host homogeneous and dimensional data types, and also C-table, which is meant for heterogeneous types in a columnar state, in a columnar way. So here is the difference between contiguous and chunked. For example, NumPy is an example of a contiguous data container. And that means that when you define an array in, in NumPy, you have a block of memory which is, which is contiguous, right? Here, in CRA, in Bcalls, we split the different data area in blocks. They are called chunks, OK? Because the blocks are, I mean, every chunk is, has, a, has a block inside. I'm not going to, to enter into the details because they can be very complex, but I just want you to get the idea. Everything is chunked here. And the, the interesting thing is that you can compress individually every chunk. And when you need this chunk, this chunk will be transmitted in a compressed state to the caches, will be decompressed in the cache, and you will be able to operate on, with that. Also, I said that the C table, the heterogeneous container, is columnar. Why columnar? Just because it adapts better to newer computer architectures. Why? Right now, if we have a row-wise table, so for example, an unstructured NumPy array, if we are interested in just one single column, like this one here, the system, the architecture of newer systems, when, whenever you touch this integer 32, which is four bytes, the, the, the hardware is not grabbing only, only four bytes, but the hardware is grabbing this, the, the next 64 bytes. In five minutes? OK. <laughs> time, time flies. Um, and it transmits all the 64 bytes. And that means if we are handling only this the uh, condition, for example, on this, on this column, we can see that we get, um, instead of getting four bytes per, per element, we are getting 64 bytes, which is called the cache line. And that means that we are wasting a lot of resources because the, the bandwidth is, is waste, right? Whereas if we store data in a columnar way, okay, we are getting exactly the, 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 that, the data that we, need, that we need into the CPU. Okay, because the contiguous, the contiguous data is here. Okay. Also, if, as we group data that has similar properties, there is much less entropy between element to element in the same column, and that means much better compressions. So, for recalls, it is very, very important to have columnar approach. Here we see some projects using recalls. So Visual Fabric, which is a company that we have several people working for, for this company, is using uh, Bcalls through a new software on top of Bcalls, which is called BigQuery, which is basically to, uh, to allow out-of-court group buys. Uh, also, the Scikit Allel, which is using genomics, uh, is using Bcalls with uh, a lot of success. And Quantopian is also um, using Bcalls ex very extensively in their infrastructure. So this is BigQuery in action. It is able to do group buys 
out of core in a, and the, the, the slowdown with, um, with respect to pandas is just a factor of uh, three or four more than pandas. Pandas is doing that all in memory, whereas BigQuery is doing that all, uh, on disk. And the slowdown is just between two and four. It's a big win for them. They don't have to spend a lot of money on, on, on RAM. Uh, SSDs are much cheaper. Alistair Miles, Miles, which is the main author of Psychit Allel, is also very pleased with big calls here race. And let me have uh, three minutes for explaining the new features of BLOSK2, which is, will be the, the next version of BLOSK. Uh, BLOSK, of course, has limitations. One of uh, the main limitations, in my opinion, is that um, it needs to operate with chunks. Chunks is the, is the higher level, uh, level of abstraction. In BLOSK2, uh, I am implemented a new level of abstraction that will allow several chunks to be grouped in what I call a super chunk. Why am I doing that? Well, that has a lot of advantages. One of them is that uh, it will be able to, uh, for Blosk to, to look into the redundancies between different chunks, okay? the same way that MPEG2, for example, between different frames. And then uh, also in, in BLOS2, we will have uh, more support for codecs. Z, in particular, ZSD, STD, Z the standard, which is made by the same author of uh, LC4, which is one of the best compressors, fastest compressor now. And also, uh, it will support a serialized version of the super chunk. And that means that you can store much more chunks using less resources, less inodes, okay? Because you are packing several chunks in one single inode. In the, in the file system. That's important. It will have uh, support for ARM. The ARM uh, architecture will be a first citizen, also in BLOS2. And of course, BLOS2, it's still being developed. It's still in beta, in alpha, okay? I am not going to mess anything with BLOS2. BLOS2 is developed in a completely separate um, uh, repository. And you are invited to, to test them and help me in debugging it or or even helping me to develop it, giving your time, giving your love. Okay, so the main point is that uh, due to the evolution in computer architecture, the compression can be effective for two reasons. First, we can work with more data with the same resources. And also, and especially that, we can reduce the overhead of compression to near zero, right? due to evolution of, of the CPUs, and if we know how to use the CPUs. But not only near zero, but beyond that. And that means that by using compression, we can get better performance. And I will, I will finish with a sentence of Marvin Minsky, which is the, one of the pioneers in artificial intelligence. He passed away uh, three months ago, things like that. And he said that in science, one can learn the most by studying, by studying what seems the least. And I think that, that's, that's the case in, when I got interested in compression. At the beginning, it was like a very, very tiny thing. And in my opinion, compression will be a very, very important subject. Not in the future, but it's becoming a very, very important subject now. Gracias. We have time for... Thanks, Francesc. We have a time for uh, maybe a couple of questions where we're changing laptops. Okay. Questions? You can ask in Spanish if you are not fluent enough, fluent enough in, in English. Uh, I'm fluent in English, so no problem. Okay. First of all, thanks for the talk, and uh, I wanted to ask you about the chunking uh, procedure. Yeah. Um, how is it better than having the, the whole block of memory uh, stored together? Because I, I know that it's difficult to find a big enough space in memory, but mm -hmm. if you chunk the, the data frame, mm -hmm. um, you won't be able to access the uh, new in part that fast because it will be in another place. And, uh, exactly. One of the, well, so this is one of the reasons why this has an overhead. 
No, so the question is why I cannot work with uh, continuous, continuous storage, right? Instead yeah. of a chunked one. Yeah. How is it much better to chunk it than to have it stored together? Well, to, to tell the truth, the best, the most efficient way is to have everything together because, as you said, it's much, much more easy to locate the, the information that you are interested in, right? I have not told you all the details in the CRA implementation, but the, the thing is that the CRA has index, index information in the headers, right? And he knows where the data is located in, in every header. So you have a kind of a intermediate level that uh, you have to, to go to the index first, but then you can go that. But even with that, the advantage of having the, the chunk compressed is, is I mean, is uh, compensating, so, so, so to say, this extra level of indirection. Okay? First of all, thank you for your contributions to the Python ecosystem. Thank you. And I have many questions, but, but just one. Uh, what do you think about Feather, the new disk uh, format made by Wes McKinney and Halley Wickham? I am. I have to say that I am very excited about this new development. I mean, Feather, for those of you that do, doesn't know, is the new effort that is uh, uh, is being made, not only by Wes McKinney, but with uh, a lot of uh, by a lot of uh, authors in the in the R and other arenas for storing data frames on disk. Okay, this will represent a uh, a standard way to exchange data between R, Python, C, whatever. And this is extremely important. The industry needs that. Because, I mean, everyone has, can use uh, R, Python, or whatever. The problem, uh, I mean, and that will be very important for, for exchanging data. But when you want to get better performance, you will need to uh, use specific data containers. So I see more Feather, like a common interface format, more in the, in the similar way that SDF5 is a, is a common interface format, than um, a storage or a format that is meant for extreme performance. Because as I said before, there is no silver bullet. Okay? You will need different containers for forever, basically, depending on your needs. But I, I am very excited about Feather. I think it's a very good idea. So. Let's thank our keynote speaker again. Thank you.